While L plus 2 brings a pleasant morning and time to sleep in, it is a day of waiting and documentation at the end of that waiting. About 10 minutes after liftoff, two days earlier, the empty solid rocket boosters fell into the Atlantic Ocean about 150 miles from the Florida coastline. As is standard for all launches, the two solid rocket booster retrieval ships, known as the NASA Navy, are waiting on site to pick up the boosters and bring them back to the Space Coast. Their return to Port Canaveral will occur in public areas, allowing for easy access by anyone who wishes to view the event. Early in the afternoon, the team departs the hotel for a short half-hour trip to Jetty Park, located a few miles south of the Space Center. From the long pier extended over the water at the port mouth, they set up photo and video equipment in preparation for the ship's arrival. It's not common to see multiple camera setups on tripods here on the pier, so the setup sometimes draws curiosity and questions from passers-by. But the team is always more than happy to share their plans and experiences with the public who would otherwise go on unaware of the events about to take place. Watching and documenting the uh, the return of the SRV retrieval ships, yeah, I'd say is the most difficult uh, event to plan for. In fact, I'd go so far as to say it's impossible to plan for. With no way of tracking the exact location of the ships at any given time, the team must often arrive on site well ahead of the expected arrival time, just in case the vessels pull into port earlier than expected. This, however, can result in a very long wait and we went out along the pier which is at the the port mouth at port canaveral and uh, set up our gear and just kind of started waiting on the horizon thinking oh we're going to see him within a few minutes four hours later we were all sunburned and uh still waiting and finally four hours later i, I catch sight of a of a short little white vessel with a big blue stripe on the side which is the trademark and that's when, when we were able to make the call and say, we, we, we see them, they're coming. Uh, and we were able to start getting, getting uh, video and, and photos. It's certainly an encouraging moment for the team as they know their patience has paid off. With the ships in view, the team members go to work acquiring still photography and video, although it's not much good until the ships get closer. Once sighted, it takes well over an hour for the vessels to reach the port mouth. As the team and other members of the public look on, the retrieval ships enter the port with the massive 150-foot solid rocket boosters in tow. The slow pace of the vehicles allows ample time for documentation. The team even has time to discuss the function of the boosters with curious onlookers and the events that led to this point. Uh, it, was, it was really a study in contrast from going uh, on L-1 seeing these fully loaded very intimidating boosters sitting on the launch pad to seeing them produce that awesome display of power on launch day right in front of you to having them just float by you in the water doing you know a couple miles an hour um, you know with the nose cone detached and just floating like a log you know you, it, it, they're not nearly as intimidating as they are a few days before but um, it was it was neat to see that that part of the mission come full circle. With Liberty Star and Freedom Star now safely home in Port Canaveral, the team packs up their equipment in preparation for the final event of the mission's launch phase. While in port, the SRBs will be tied up next to the ship's hulls for the final leg of their trip before being sent home to the ATK facility in Utah. With the exception of early morning launches, L plus 3 is the earliest the team will have to wake up during their excursion to the Space Coast. With the final mission event before landing about to take place a half hour or so away, waking up at 4.30 a.m. is standard for this day. With equipment packed and ready, the team gathers a few short miles west of the port mouth at the Port Canaveral Locks. This will be the final stop for the SRBs before they are towed to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station for cleaning, disassembly, and the train ride back to Utah. The port locks are also accessible by the public, so several people from both the public and media team show up to document the event. The first retrieval ship, Freedom Star, arrives at the lock around 6 a.m. With the sun still below the horizon, 
It can be difficult to acquire decent photos and videos of the vessel with its space age payload in tow. But this is also a good time for the team to experience the wonder of being so close to the rocket. During the RSS retraction event, members of the press are stationed about 500 yards from the vehicle. Here at the lock through event, they are within about 25 feet of the SRB. The process of sending the ship and booster through the lock takes only about 10 minutes, so it's not long before the pair is on its way up the river toward Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. With about a half hour or so before the second ship is sent through the lock, the team has plenty of time for more wildlife photography. With a fleet of birds all around, manatees enjoying their morning activity, and fish hopping in the lock, there's plenty of subject matter to go around. Within an hour of Freedom Star's departure, her sister ship, Liberty Star, makes her way through the port to the locks. Passing beneath the massive drawbridge, the vessel slowly crawls up the waterway for her final stop before proceeding to the Air Force Station just to the north. Liberty Star presents a unique challenge, however. Her sister ship, Freedom Star, towed the left-hand SRB, which was attached to the left side of the vessel. Due to the lock orientation, the left side of either ship is closest to the public. Liberty Star tows the right-hand SRB, meaning the booster will be blocked by the ship, almost completely out of the public view. But some quick thinking by the team on site allows them to find a way around this problem. As Liberty Star was coming up with the right-hand SRB, Chris had the, uh, the bright idea to ask the lock attendant, you know, we're, we're badged with, with nasaspaceflight.com, we, we want to get some good documentation here. Is it okay if we get on the other side of the lock? Because there's a little bridge that goes across these massive doors. And the lock attendant just looked right at us and he's like, all right. <laughs> so um, we, we scurried across the, across the lock uh, real quick, all, all five of us, and uh, just, just waited for the ship to come. <clears throat> and by, like right after we, we made it over to the, to the other side, that's when the, the doors opened and nobody else could get across. So we, for that, that particular mission, we were able to get some pretty, pretty unique footage that nobody else was getting at the time. With Liberty Star now making her way to the Air Force Station, the team's work with launch operation documentation comes to a close. The next phase of their work will be continued processing of photos and video, as well as preparing for the eventual landing of the orbiter at Kennedy Space Center, be it a straight return from orbit or on a ferry flight atop the 747 shuttle carrier aircraft. For some, however, the journey of covering events here in Florida ends here with the solid rocket boosters. For seven and a half years wanting nothing but to see a launch, it had happened, I was satisfied. And I had gotten much more out of that experience than I'd ever thought possible anyway, so it, it really was, I'd say, the best, the best trip of my life. And it's something that I'll, I'll certainly never forget.